We have a question, yes. Um, in the solution for the second time work, yes. the final problem, yes. um, when, I'm not sure why the integration is necessary. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that because uh, I would say about half the class had trouble with the final part in the second homework. So I plan to discuss that, but I hope to discuss it when our friends in Stockholm could hear because they were equally uh, concerned about that. Um, of course, I could. Uh, my well known uh, procedure when we have a meeting of the faculty is always start on time with the thought that people will arrive sooner if you start, whereas if you wait for them, they'll take much longer to arrive. So based on that theory, I'm going to start the class. How's that? And uh, we'll see if it works. If, if it doesn't, we'll <laughs> try something else. So let's, let's talk about the second homework. Um, and most people got everything right up to the final final bell. So let me start here. Uh, so here's homework. Oops, number two. I guess it's almost readable. Um, so you had, um, of course, it's a statics problem, right? So it's uh, Hamilton's principle reduces to this, right? And then you had expressions for the virtual work, which is the virtual work due to the non-conservative aerodynamic forces. And of course, the potential energy. And at the end of the day, um, you ended up after um, writing down the expression for U and W, you end up with something like this. You had, uh, of course, there's an interval over time from T1 to T2. And then, uh, so there's a DT equals zero. And then inside this, there's a tail term, which is minus DD. Yeah. Oh, that's not, huh. My official homework solution is wrong. <laughs> well, I will attribute it to a typographical error on his part. Uh, it's um, it's gj uh, d alpha dy times delta alpha from zero to l, and uh, this minus sign arises from this minus sign, and then there's a plus integral from zero to l uh, of um, I didn't leave myself quite enough room, but I'll try. Anyway, I'll write small. D, D, Y of G, J, this is still not going to do it, is it? D, alpha, D, Y, plus 2 pi Q infinity, C, E, alpha, and then... Uh, I don't like that at all, so I'm going to write it again. I'll start over here. <laughs> Minus GJ. Oh, my, oh, sorry, thank you. D alpha dy, L alpha, zero to L, um, plus then um, an integral from zero to L. You know, eventually have a DT over here too. Um, D dy of G J D alpha dy plus this two pi Q infinity E C alpha del alpha DX 
dt equals zero, right? I, 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 there's a method in my manuals. Uh, oh, I didn't notice that he, he's, the official homework, he did a brilliant job, right? But he screwed up the tail train, that's right. But this is the correct tail train. And so the reason I want to write this out is because this is the equivalent of that, right? This is just all the details of performing these operations. And as it stands, because I've got the GJ inside this derivative, this is valid for uh, GJ a function of Y, E, and C are functions Y, et cetera, okay? Now, why did I write this all out in extremis? Well, because we're going to now develop a solution for the variable property case. We expand this in a series functions of time times some functions of y. And the key, or a key, is how we choose those functions. Okay. And when we substitute this in here, we're going to develop some equations, some ordinary difference equations for the q eventually. Okay. And from that, we will then be able to do a, a actually, this is a stacks case, so these don't even have to be a functions of time. We're going to develop a series of equations for the q. And because this is a status case, those equations are going to be linear algebraic equations for the Q. If we had a dynamic case where we included kinetic energy, for example, then we would end up with ordinary different equations in time for the Q. But this is static, so it's going to be linear algebra. Okay. okay, so what are the choices? This is equation one. This is equation two. What are the choices? Well, the choices are are several fold. First of all, how we choose those functions. And then which form of, of in this case, it's really the principle of virtual work, which is the static part of Hamlin's principle. Which form are we going to use? Are we going to use this form when, when we set this bracket to quantity zero? That's the different equation for alpha, right? But then we do have to think about this tail term. The easiest thing to do, the easiest thing to do is choose functions which satisfy the boundary conditions associated with the tail term. What does that mean? We want psi sub m of y to be zero at y equals zero, and we want d psi sub m dy to be zero at y equals l. Do we know any such functions? What, are, what, what would be the obvious thing to choose for the functions, given the fact that in the previous part of the homework, you, you uh, solved for the case where g, j, c, and e were constants and did not depend on y. So what functions would you obviously want to use? You don't want to use those constant property functions. Why? Because they do satisfy these bound conditions. And if the variable properties aren't wildly varying, you know, they're smoothly varying, the gj goes from 1 to 2, or c goes from 0.5 to 0.7, I mean, why not? Now, okay, so that's one choice. The next choice is how many terms in this series do I need? If I'm in a hurry, and I got to get an answer to my boss by five o'clock and it's four o'clock, I use one term. On the other hand, if if she gives me a week to do it, I might set a computer code that allow me to do as many terms as I like and I'd show convergence of the answer as the number of terms in the series gets large and so forth. But in the homework, I assume you're in a great rush. And therefore I suggest you only use one term. So let me do one term first, because it'll simplify things also. And then I'll do any number of terms if you, if you want me to. By the way, parenthetically, for those of you who are reading the book, this was all worked out in the book. <laughs> so if you had read chapter two, the, end, the homework was worked out in the book. That's okay. Anyway. Uh, okay, so we're going to use these fun we're going to use functions to satisfy these bank conditions, so I don't need to worry about that. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to use this. We're going to have uh, now 
the integral from zero to L of uh, d d y of g j, and I'm going to use one term in the series. Yeah. Yeah. Are they yeah. Hello, are you, are you Stockholm? Are you there? Uh, yes. <laughs> so you have. Yeah, uh, yeah, you had some uh, technical problem. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Well, what I'm doing now is I'm discussing the homework number two. And okay. I'm discussing the last part of the homework. Uh, because that's the one, uh, that's the part that several people in both Stockholm and Durham had some uh, difficulty with. And so we're talking about the case where the torsional stiffness GJ and the chord C and the uh, distance from uh, the elastic axis to the aerodynamic center, which is E, all of those might vary with Y. Okay? And so just to recapitulate very quickly, and by the way, you'll have copies of these notes, so don't bother to write them all down unless you absolutely insist. I know that you, I know many people have the habit of writing down notes. You'd be better actually to listen than to write down notes, in my opinion. I mean, you could write down a little question mark and say, that was totally obscure. I wonder what the hell he meant by that. But but writing down the equations is foolish because they're all in the book or all in the notes, right? You're not going to learn anything by writing down that equation. That's my opinion. But, Feel free to do it if, if that's your habit and makes you feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, okay, so here's here's Hamilton's principle reduced to statics. Minus the virtual change in potential energy plus the virtual change in work equals zero. And and everyone took the expression for U and W and plugged it in, and you all got what I call equation one. When you integrate it by parts and you got a tail term and you got this in the proper expression so that you're going to multiply it by del alpha. And then uh, if you're trying to drive the difference equation, you say, well, del alpha is arbitrary and and therefore the thing that uh, um, multiplies it must be zero. And you make the same argument over here. Either del alpha itself is zero, so this term goes away, or del alpha is arbitrary, in which case what it is multiplied by must be zero. And that gives you the boundary conditions. And then I said, we're going to expand in a series of functions. And these functions, from a mathematical view, point of view, they can be any set of functions as long as they're complete, which means they could be Fourier series or Bustle functions or uh, Legendre polynomials or any number of things. They could be. But most sensible people would pick them to be functions which relate to the physics of the, of the model, which in the obvious choice is the, the eigenfunctions for the case when G, J, C, and E are constants. Right? They're probably the best choice. Okay. So now we're taking one term, because we want to simplify our algebra, one term in this series, equation two, and, and substitute it into equation one, and the result will be equation three, I hope. So we have GJ, now we have Q1 psi 1, or actually D psi 1 dy, right? Uh, plus 2 pi Q infinity E C uh, Q1 psi 1 times delta of alpha, but delta alpha is delta of Q1 times psi 1 dx. And then, of course, uh, it's all integrated with respect to time as well. Equals zero, right? And we make the same argument as before, namely, the del now the del Q1 are arbitrary. And if this is to hold at all times, then what's inside the bracketed integral with respect to time must be zero. Okay? Questions? Because this is the key point. Once, once, once you accept this, it's all over, except for the algebra. Okay? All right. Everybody know questions? I'm going to press on. So now, we have then the integral from 0 to L of 
partial inspector Y of uh, GJ Q1, partial psi 1 with respect to Y, plus 2 pi Q infinity E C Q1 psi 1. Another psi one. Remember that psi one came from from del q one times psi one, right? I'm canceling out the del q one. D, I said dx. Why did I say dx? You let me do that. Dy equals zero. Sorry about that. I'm accustomed to thinking all spatial integrals will start with x and then go to y and z, but we're calling this one y, right? Okay. Well. Uh, now we need to separate out the things that depend on y and the things that do not. So in the first term, I've, I've got a q1. Well, I've got a q. I don't even need to go that far. I've got a q1 here. I've got a q1 there. It's equal to zero. Either q1 zero or it's not. Well, q1 zero, not very interesting. So I'm looking for the divergence condition, right? So that means the, the condition for non-trivial values now of q1 which means everything that multiplies Q1 must be zero. So I'm going to cancel out the Q1. And then I have what? I have the integral from zero to L of partial respect of Y of GJ partial of psi one with respect of Y times the psi one here, psi one dy, not explicitly separating out these terms, plus two pi Q infinity never to be confused with Q1, right? This is dynamic pressure. Uh, these things don't depend on Y, right? Times the integral from zero to L of E, C, there's a psi one there, and another psi one there, so the psi one squared dy equals zero, right? Now, using higher mathematics, I'm going to solve for the value of dynamic pressure, which makes this true. That's the divergence dynamic pressure. So once I cancel out the Q1, I'm really now dealing with divergence, right? I'm not dealing with all the possible dynamic pressures in the world. I'm dealing with the one at which divergence occurs. Okay, so I'll put a big D on that. So Q infinity D equals minus this integral, over 2 pi times this integral. All right? Notice the minus sign. If this is to be physically meaningful, which I hope it will be, well, this that let's look at the denominator. E, C are going to be positive numbers, right? They may vary with Y, but they're going to be positive numbers. Psi 1 squared is certainly a positive number. So this 2 pi is positive. So this denominator is positive. But you can work this out by putting in the Psi 1 either for the pen pen case or the clamp free case, right? And you will discover that the numerator, the integral, is negative. So minus times minus equals plus, and you'll get a plus value for the dynamic pressure. By the way, uh, if you had a certain case, it wouldn't happen very often, but occasionally you might actually get a negative value for Q for, for, for the divergence dynamic pressure. In this case, you won't. It'll, be, it'll turn out to be positive. But if you got a negative number, would you be, and you're the designer of this airplane, would you be happy or unhappy? What? Why would you be unhappy? Say again. Any any positive pressure would diverge. No, that wouldn't mean to. It wouldn't diverge at all because you can't have a negative dynamic pressure. Only I mean physically only positive value. So you what this says you require a negative dynamic pressure to cause this wing to diverge. Uh huh. That's that's what we say. So you'd be happy. Except that if you chose to fly the wing backwards. <laughs> if you think about it, you chose to fly the wing backwards, 
it would diverge because then the, the way it would work out the time pressure would be positive going the other way. Yeah, no, so, yeah. But normally these numbers turn out to be positive. Or they're, but, okay, let me leave it there. Other, other, I'm going to pause here. I'm going to say a little more about this, but, but let me pause here to see if there are questions. Anything here in Durham? Stockholm. Hello there. You have any questions so far? No, thanks. Great. I'm happy to hear that. Now, I'm going to show you how to get the same answer quickly once again. Uh, by the way, for those of you who uh, like to put names on things, this method I've just described is the Rayleigh Ritz method. You don't really need to know that, except that if you're having a conversation and you're trying to get a job, it'd be a good thing for you to know, right? Um, now, if you actually know something about the Rayleigh Ritz method from some prior exposure in another course, it's usually used in the context of dynamics problems. So this is sort of this. But from a mathematical perspective, it's really Ritz, even though we're using it on a statics problem. But now we're going to get the same result using another famous name associated with it. Uh, uh, Rayleigh is Lord Rayleigh, who did lots of things. He wrote a wonderful two-volume series on the theory of sound. He's most noted for his work in acoustics, but he had, did a lot of work in vibrations. Ritz was a German uh, who came along considerably later and basically expanded on what Rayleigh had done. But then there was a Russian mathematician engineer around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century named Gerlerkin. So let me tell you what Mr. Gerlerkin did. Let's talk about the Gerlerkin method, which is another famous method that's sometimes used. And for this method, I'm going to uh, write down the differential equation for alpha. Okay, that's the different equation, right? And also there's some boundary conditions, which in our case are alpha equals zero at y equals zero, and d alpha dy equals zero at y equals l. Uh, Lurkin also said, let's take alpha and write it as a series. And we'll put this in here, right? And let's start again with one term, right? And by the way, and, uh, and I'll connect this up uh, with Rayleigh Ritz in a moment. By the way, in this method, it's absolutely essential that these functions satisfy these boundary conditions. Because as you see, I'm only going to work with a different equation. So if I don't choose these functions to satisfy those boundary conditions, you're going to get a bad answer. If I use Legendre polynomials or Bessel functions of something else that didn't satisfy these boundary conditions, I'd, get, I'd be in big, big trouble. Never get the right answer. But if you use the obvious choice of functions which satisfy these boundary conditions, Glerkin will work just fine. So we take, let's see, I'm going to call this. Uh, I'll remember some of these other equations so you'll have them in your notes. Now we're on equation six. And I'll just give this a number again, although we wrote it down before. I'm going to put seven and six, and I'm only going to use one term. And then I'm going to get this. Um, and uh, oh, well, one, and there's a Q1, of course, plus two pi Q infinity E C Q1 psi one equals zero. All right, that's what I get by taking seven, putting it into six. I get eight. All right. 
again, I'm not interested in, in trivial solutions. I'm not interested in Q1 being zero, right? So I can cancel out the Q1s, right? And now, what to do? Well, some of you sort of left it in this form and solved this equation with Q infinity. But of course, that left the psi one as a function of y. And if you'd gone one step further, I would have accepted that as an approximation. But you would have to choose some value of y, right? If you chose y equals zero, you get a lousy answer. Why? Because that would be zero. <laughs> if you choose y equals l, you get a lousy answer because that would be zero. So probably you want to choose y equals l over two, right? I mean, you can pick your favorite guy. If you do that, if you had done that, that actually is a method. It's not a very good method, but it's a method. It's called the, in English at least, it's called the co-location method. If you choose y equals something. Probably not zero or L though, right? Maybe L over two. But Glorkin says there's a better way. The better way to multiply this equation by psi one and integrate from zero to L. Because that sort of gives you a weighted average, right? And you're, as a weight function, you're using this mode shape. Note that if you do that, you get Rayleigh Ritz, right? <laughs> you get the same answer as you got with Rayleigh Ritz. Now, there's someone else in the class, I forgot who it was, someone else, and this is not totally bogus. It's not a very good idea, but it's not awfully wrong. It's just not a very good idea. Someone said, well, let's just integrate this equation as it stands without multiplying by psi 1 from 0 to L. You get an answer. That's better than than saying why just saying some saying y to equal to some value like zero L. I mean that'd be a terrible thing to do, right? So there are various things you can do, but at, over the last hundred years or so, most people have agreed that you really want to use Rayleigh Ritz or Galerkin. It's not that there aren't other ways to do it. It's just that the other ways aren't as good. They don't give you as good an answer. Okay. Okay, so let me pause there because I have one other thing I want to say about this. But any questions about that here in Durham, North Carolina? No. Stockholm. Any questions in Stockholm? Nope. All right. Final thing we're going to do is we're going to do the case where we have any number of terms in this series. Okay. And uh, I'm going to do Galerkin because we just proved that you get the same answer with Glerkin as you get with the Rayleigh Ritz, provided each of these functions satisfies the bounding conditions. Okay, so I'm gonna use Glerkin because it's easier algebraically. But I wanna tell you one thing that's a standard question on, a, on a, an exam, oral exam, like a qualifier. Can I use, if I use the Rayleigh Ritz method, can I use functions which do not satisfy the bounding conditions? and still get a good answer? The answer is yes. And that's why some people prefer Rayleigh Ritz because I don't need, if you look closely in Rayleigh Ritz, remember, I went back to the energies and I had an expression which still involved the tail terms. So if I go back to the energies and stuff that the series in, and I don't satisfy any of the boundary conditions except the geometric ones, namely in this case, alpha equals zero at y equals zero. But I don't have to satisfy the boundary condition with these functions at y equals l. And sometimes in more complex problems, not this one, it's convenient not to have to satisfy all the bound conditions. I may have a hard time finding functions that satisfy all the bound conditions. Or I may not be absolutely sure what they are for whatever reason. Um, so Rayleigh Ritz does have the advantage, which is occasionally one times out of 100, <laughs> useful. Namely, you don't have to satisfy all the bound Okay. All right. So now, so what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to take equation six. Now we're going to put equation seven in, but now we're going to retain as many terms as you like. I don't care how many. Seventeen is my favorite number. Normally, uh, 
normally a problem like this, certainly a problem like this, probably one gives you a really good answer, and three would be gangbusters, right? But again, more complex problems you might need more. So we're going to put seven and six, and now we're going rather than getting eight, we're going to get nine, and now we're going to have partial with respect to y of gj, the sum over m of qm, partial psi m with respect to y, uh, plus 2 pi q infinity c e summation over m qm psi m equals zero. And just to be explicit, we now have 17 terms in this series. So we have 17 Q sub Ms, right? We have Q1, Q2, up to Q17. You will note that this is one equation. I have a big problem. I have 17 things I want to know. I have 17 unknowns and only one equation. It's the fishes and the loaves for those of you who are biblical scholars. I need to turn I need to turn one equation into 17 equations. But Glurkin says, not a problem. I've got 17 of these functions. So I'm going to multiply this equation by psi 1 and integrate it, and then multiply by psi 2 and integrate it. I'm going to multiply, I'm going to generate 17 equations and 17 unknowns. They're linear algebraic equations. I'll put this in the form of a matrix times q1, q2, 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 right? And in that matrix will be a parameter called the dynamic pressure. And by the way, once I, I multiply through by these functions, I can do all these integrals first before I form this matrix, right? But then I'm going to have a matrix, and q infinity is going to appear there. And the condition for non-trivial solutions for all of these q1 through q17 coordinates is what? About, what do I need to say about that matrix? Well, th there's a, there's a requirement on that matrix. If you took a course in linear algebra recently, that you might remember that says the condition for non-trivial solutions of a set of linear algebra equations expressed in the form of a matrix times the unknowns is that something of that matrix has got to be zero. What is it? The determinant. And if I multiply out that determinant, what would I get? I would get a polynomial of degree 17 in Q infinity. So I have, a, I have a, a couple of choices. Of course, this is all done in software that someone's written for you. But in the software, they could do one of a couple of things. They could multiply out the 17 degree polynomial and find the, the 17 roots, some of which might be positive, some of which might be negative. It turns out they'll all be real numbers. Uh, there's a theorem by Lord Rayleigh that says that, among other people. Uh, or I could just plot the value of the determinant as a function of Q infinity. And, and wait and see where I cross the axis. That's sort of the brute force approach. Or I could use any one number of algorithms that have been developed over the years for finding the, the eigenvalues, because Q infinity is an eigenvalue of this matrix, right? It's the one that thinks that determines it. So now I've told you all you want to know and more about how to attack the variable G, J, C, and E problem, right? It's really not so much, I mean, you got to work out those intervals, but right? that's not bad. And if, by the way, if you couldn't work them out analytically, that's not the worry because you just write down the functions and you call some software to your team and says, give me the numerical integration result of multiplying these functions. In fact, in a real airplane wing, you probably wouldn't know um, uh, these properties necessarily at every position along the wing. You might know them at discrete positions, right? And then you have to make some approximation to do it. Okay, anything else about homework number two? Stockholm, you want to know anything about homework number two that I have not yet covered? No, thanks. <laughs> I think he said, it. you told, he told me much more than I ever wanted to know about this. Stuff. Okay, fine, very good. All right. Now, let's uh, move in right along. What else are we going to do today? Um, oh, Stockholm. 
uh, and Durham as well. You're welcome to send me your homework via email. In fact, I would actually prefer you do that and send it directly to me. Um, you can put it on Sakai, but I probably won't look at it unless you tell me it's on there and I have to look at it. But I would prefer to get it directly. That'll save me a couple of keystrokes. And really the same thing is true here. If you want to hand it to me personally, that's fine. That, that works. But if you put it in my mailbox, I don't look at my mailbox every day. I might look at it once a week, right? Or when somebody in the office says it's full up. I mean, I respond to email very quickly. I, all the other forms of communication are much slower. So email Okay. Let's talk about orthogonality, because I, I said a little bit about orthogonality um, at the end of the last lecture, but I wanted to say more about it because it's a really important idea for lots of reasons. And we can we can use the current homework example to to illustrate orthogonality. So let me do that. Okay. Um, this difference equation has eigenfunctions, even for the case where G, J, C, and E vary with Y. You'll note that in my previous discussion, I didn't try to determine those eigenfunctions. And the reason was they're hard to determine. <laughs> Right? And so it's much easier to use the eigenfunctions for the case where E, C, and G, J are constants to approximate the solution for the case where G, J, C, and E vary with Y. But there are eigenfunctions for both the case G, J, C, and E constant as well as the case where G, J, C, and E have any variation you like with Y, allowing for the fact that there might be an occasional pathological case that we don't need to worry about. But the point I'm making is that if I use m to denote the nth eigenfunction, then I'm going to call psi m as that as that eigenfunction, right? And corresponding to that eigenfunction, there is an eigenvalue, namely the divergence dynamic pressure that corresponds to that eigenfunction. So I'm going to call that q sub infinity m. And remember how the game is played. When we when we do that 17 by 17 matrix and we get those 17 values of uh, of, uh, of Q infinity, the lowest positive value wins or loses, depending on your perspective. It's the one that's physically significant. That's when my wing is going to diverge, because if if the lowest value is 10 meters per second, oh well, we're doing this in dynamic pressure, so it's 10 psi or a tenth of PSI or one PSI. If there are other eigenvalues for Q infinity that are 100 PSI, who cares? Because by then, this linear model is broken down, right? Because the system is already unstable above the lowest positive value of Q infinity. They're mathematically interesting, but they have no physical significance. But it's still true that, that they may be interesting from a mathematical point of view. So we, we think about so now, uh, so I'm, uh, that's all by way of saying I'm going to prove orthogonality for the case where G, J, C, and E are not constant because it's just as easy. See, there's a theme here. I do the things that are easy. I can, I'll do it. I'll make it as general as I can without doing any extra work. But if you prefer, I could do the case where, where G, J, C, and E are constants, but it, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so here's the idea. We have this equation, and this is equation 10. And now I'm going to produce two more equations. I'm going to produce an equation like this for the for the nth eigenvalue. I'm also going to uh, produce it for the nth eigenvalue, where m and n are two different eigenvalues. If you want, I can call them 1 and 2 or 16 and 17. Anyway, two different ones, right? So I've got this. Uh, Um, 
put a lot of super and subscripts on this, I want to remind you that this is a divergence, a mathematical divergence value. It doesn't correspond to all Q infinities. It's just the magic ones where, where mathematically I have a divergence result. And it's the nth one, not, not any of the others. And then I have C, E, alpha, N, E, zero. And then I have the same thing, same thing for another mode. Okay. Now, as is often the case, improving something is often only important and helpful to know what is what is true. <laughs> so I'm going to anticipate what is true. What is true is the following: uh, the integral of c e alpha m alpha n d y is zero for m not equal to n, and it's something else when they are. It's, it's not zero when m and n are the same. It's, we're also going to show that gj d alpha m dy d alpha n dy dy is zero for m not equal to n. Okay? So there are actually two orthogonality conditions associated in this case with each of these terms. So that's why I want to prove. So the obvious thing to do, he said, is take this equation and multiply by alpha n, and this equation and multiply by alpha m, and then integrate, because at least that will produce something that looks like this term, right? Um, it won't produce anything quite like this term, but not to fear, because one of the few tricks I know will allow us to convert this term into this term, and this term. And that, remember, by, by the time I get done, I'm going to have alpha m time this, and then I'm going to integrate. And the way I get that result to look like this is I integrate by parts. And then I'll integrate by parts, but I'll have a tail term, but the tail terms will be zero because they must satisfy the boundary condition, right? And so it'll, it'll come out all right. Okay. So let's let's do the following. Let's do let's do what I just said. We're gonna multiply um, multiply eleven by alpha n and and integrate from zero to L dy. We're gonna multiply twelve by alpha m and integrate. Okay. Now, if I do that, these two terms don't look quite the same, right? This is this has the derivative with respect to alpha m n times alpha n. This has derivative with alpha n. But when I integrate by parts, and the tail terms go away. In fact, these two terms are going to be exactly the same, right? Therefore, then I'm going to subtract these two equations, and those terms will all go away. And all I have left is a term just like this, except in front of it, I'll have, well, I'll have two pi that doesn't count. But then I'll have qm minus qn. So if I say I'm really looking at two distinct eigenfunctions with two distinct eigenvalues for the dynamic pressure at which divergence occurs, those q's won't be the same, but the whole thing must be zero, and therefore this must be zero. That's orthogonality. On the other hand, if I want to prove the other thing, what do I do? Well, I take this equation and divide through by that, and this equation and divide through by that, and then I, those are gone, right? But then I play the same game, and I multiply and integrate, and then I subtract the equation. The two terms cancel. And over here, I have 1 over QM times this term, minus 1 over qn times this term. And if the q's aren't the same, then this thing must be 0. But now I've integrated by parts, so it really looks like this. Aha. Uh -huh. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> OK. 
Uh, what else could I do? Well, I could look at the case where M and N equal each other, in which case I only need one equation. I could multiply this equation by alpha M and integrate, and this equation and integrate this too. And then I could solve this equation for the divergence dynamic pressure. If I use the exact mode shape, I would get the exact divergence dynamic pressure for that mode. If I don't know it, I guess. What what would I guess? I would guess, well, it's just the, it's just the one mode solution we talked about before. I would guess with the, the mode shape for the constant G, J, C, and E. I hope that was good enough. Uh, if you do that, that's, that's also usually credited to Lord Rayleigh. It's called Rayleigh's Quotient Method. You know, there are all these names. Um, if you say that must be a result due to Lord Rayleigh, 90% of the time you'll be right, because he did he did most of the things in vibration and acoustics that are worth remembering. Uh, okay. By the way, one other thing about orthogonality, and then I'll stop it. At least for the moment about orthogonality. You could look at a different physical situation. You could look at the case where, um, you know, this, this is probably worth saying. You could look at the case where we don't have any aerodynamics, but now we have dynamics. So now we have kinetic energy and inertia, moment of inertia, and all that. In which case, uh, what does that equation look like? Someone remind me of. Minus I alpha, is this right? Alpha double dot, and this is going to be minus, minus, and I think this is going to be a plus, right? Is that right? So this is the equation of, of just structural dynamics, if you will, in torsion, right? It's the inertia and the stiffness term. And now I might say something like this, alpha bar e to the, I'll put i omega mt, because I know physically that this corresponds to an oscillation with a certain frequency, right? That's why I know there's an i there. You, you, you could make this e to the lambda mt and work out the consequences. You would find that lambda m is an imaginary number. But for our final purposes, it doesn't matter which, which one of these you use. I'll use either one. You have a preference? You want these? Uh, I, I would too. That's what. Okay. So now, what do we have? If we take uh, this is equation uh, thirteen. If we uh, and this, we'll call this fourteen. So we put fourteen and thirteen, and we'll get uh, plus i alpha uh, omega m squared uh, alpha bar. E i omega t, but that's going to cancel out. Uh, alpha bars are going to cancel out too, of course. Um, uh, oh, I, I should make this put an m on that, right? Because this this thing, this alpha bar m, depends on y, right? So. Uh, Uh, oh, I said something wrong. Sorry about that. They're not the alpha bars are not going to cancel out. Sorry about that, because the alpha bars depend on y, so it's still a function, right? But now I could write down the same thing. For, this is the nth mode. This is the nth vibrating resonant mode of the structure. I could write down the same thing for the nth mode, and I could play the same game I played before and improve orthogonality. But now this is orthogonality with respect to some dynamic modes without aerodynamics, whereas what I was talking about a moment before were static modes that are dealing with the case where there's some aerodynamics, right? right? So orthogonality has a very general uh, uh, consequence and, and helpfulness in these kinds of situations. Okay. Last thing, uh, I'm on a roll here, right? Last thing, I'm going to do this. Let's do it all together.
plus 2 pi q infinity and I want c e alpha equals 0. So now I've got this aerodynamic model, this stiffness model, and this inertia model, right? And this equation has eigenmodes and orthogonality properties of those as well, but you have to be a little careful about saying what the eigenvalue is. In, in stagger elasticity, we always thought when we did eigenvalue analysis of Q infinity being the eigenvalue, right? We're going to find the special values where divergence will occur. If I wanted to know, on the other hand, physically how the how the oscillating frequency omega m varies as I change dynamic pressure, which is something I might want to know, right? Then I think of Q infinity as being a parameter and omega sub m as varying with that parameter. And so, therefore, I would think of omega m as being the eigenvalue, usually. And Q infinity is no longer the eigenvalue, it's a parameter. And the reason I emphasize this is that that's the situation we'll encounter when we do dynamics and we do, when we do flutter. Okay. So normally in a flutter analysis, Q infinity is no longer the eigenvalue. It's, it's, it's the thing that the eigenvalues depend on, and we're looking for how the frequencies, and also it turns out how the damping of the system changes as a function of airspeed or, or dynamic pressure. But you could... You could also, for this equation, I'll call it 15. You could still play the same game we played above. And you would find what? What would you find if you if you uh, tried to find the eigenvalues of make of m? You would find what you found in the homer, first homework problem, namely that they're, the omega sub m's are real numbers, i.e. the total i omega m is an imaginary number, up to divergence, and then these eigenvalues split off and omega m becomes imaginary or i omega m becomes real, one with a positive part which indicates instability, one with a negative part indicating that that's stable. But if if you have anything that's unstable, the whole system's unstable. And you can have 100 modes and one of them's unstable, the whole system's unstable. The fact that 99, this is not democracy. The fact that 99, <laughs> Modes of stable does not offset one un unstable mode. It's the unstable mode that, that dominates. I almost made a political comment, but I, I held back. I held back. I held, I, I, I held back. Let the record show I held back. Um, okay. Now that that is all I want to say today about orthogonality. Any questions about orthogonality? Hearing none. Okay, I'm. Uh, we have a little time left. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change uh, topics. I'm going to start talking about dynamics of linear systems. And since we only have 15 minutes or so, I'm not going to tell you everything that you need to know. But I'm going to give you a preview and suggest gently that you start reading Chapter Three. Even if you had dynamic system theory before, I would still take a look. Here's what we're going to do. Preview of dynamics of linear systems. And the linear is really important because there's a whole nother discussion of the system becomes nonlinear. And I'll just say in passing that most of the research, as opposed to what is done in engineering practice, most of the research is now is dealing with nonlinear systems, right? Because we think that there's a substantial group of people out there in the world who understand linear systems well enough. Okay? That doesn't mean that you're quite there yet. Necessarily. But uh hopefully um, by the end of this course you'll be closer. And then if you get into research you'll be doing nonlinear systems. But Linear systems are also easier, and there's a very powerful and complete theory of dynamics of linear systems. And the way I like to think about it, and the way I think many other people do as well, is you, you build on 
Fourier series. So if you, you remember Fourier series? And we're going to look at so-called simple harmonic motion to begin with. What does that mean? That means if alpha is the function of time, I can write it as some alpha bar, which might depend on y or may not, times e to the i omega t. We're, we're going to allow omega to be whatever we want it to be for the use we want to make of it. But at the moment, just think of it as a prescribed frequency. I have, I have a dynamical system, and I excite it with a certain frequency. It's linear, so it can only respond at that same frequency. That's all a linear system can do. It can't res If I put in a certain frequency, it's not going to respond. A linear system is not going to respond at twice that frequency. A nonlinear system might, <laughs> but not a linear system. A linear systems can only respond, the model of a linear system can only respond same frequency. In fact, one way you know whether the system is linear or not, if you're doing an experiment, is you see I put a frequency in, and the only frequency I get out of the same frequency, it's effectively behaving as a linear system. Uh, but if I see some higher harmonics and subharmonics or whatever, either integer multiples or divisor, divisors of uh, that frequency, then, then we know some nonlinearity is taking place. Okay, so that's fine. But then uh, we'll go from there to periodic response. What is periodic response? It means every so often, at certain discrete intervals in time, the motion repeats itself. Some part motion repeats itself, right? Because if I have a certain frequency, the corresponding period, <clears throat> period uh, equals 2 pi over omega. <clears throat> That's the period. Okay? That's the period. Uh, associated with simple harmonic motion. But Mr. Fourier and subsequent investors said, I can take a series of these guys. Of, see, we're doing series again. I can take a series of terms like this, the Fourier series, and represent any periodic motion. It doesn't have to be just simple harmonic one frequency. It could be it could be something that looks a little bit different. In fact, let me draw a picture over here. Here's time. If a simple, if I could draw better, if a simple harmonic motion in time, it goes a sine wave, right, or a cosine wave, just, and then keeps going, right? Here's the period. Whereas if I'm in periodic motion, well, it might look like this, and It, it could be ugly, but the point is, it's, it still has a period. It's just that to represent this curve, I'm going to need a whole series of these functions rather than just one. Okay, so here we're going to have alpha of t is some summation over m of alpha m. These might depend on space, but they don't depend on time. M times e i m. I'll call it omega naught t, where omega naught is by definition 2 pi over t, or t is 2 pi over omega naught, where we call this the base frequency, and this is the base period, okay? So we're going to work out the dynamics for simple harmonic motion and then say any periodic motion is just a simple summation of harmonics, right? And then we're going to move on to any arbitrary time dependence. Or if you will, non-periodic motion, which simply means it never repeats. Some people might call that random, OK? Um, but it doesn't repeat. So how are we going to treat that? Well, I'll put a knot on this. Um, oops. Sorry about that. Um, 
Well, we're going to treat this by formally taking the limit as this period goes to infinity. We can do that. When we take that limit, these Fourier series are going to turn into Fourier integrals over all time. And then it turns out there's a special theory that's been developed for the case of random, I'll put that, that's in quotation marks, random motions. And so we'll, we'll eventually look at random motions and talk about correlation functions And we'll talk about power spectrum. These are unfortunate ter terms, unfortunate because they don't really tell you in an obvious way what they are. <laughs> it turns out the power spectra is the Fourier transform of the correlation function, and the correlation function is the inverse Fourier transform of the power spectrum. So we're still going to be dealing with, with Fourier transforms, but in a special context. Also, the order correlation function, well, I won't tell you more about that. Our order correlation function is, is closely allied with the idea of mean square values. And so, so often in uh, a random vibration theory, you don't, you don't really want to know the details of time history. If you did, you'd deal with um, just the Fourier transforms in its usual form. But if you're only interested in mean square values and not the details of time area. There's a really elegant theory that relates to correlation functions and power spectra that's been developed, which is used in many engineering contexts, including gust response. So if you're doing gust response analysis with an aircraft, you can do it several different ways. We'll mention a few of those ways, but using the ideas of correlation functions and power spectra is often the way you want to do it. And the way that it's done, uh, it was originally developed by some people at Bell Laboratories who were concerned with electrical signals and noise and electrical signals. But that's why they chose that poor language. You see, if an aerospace engineer had done it, we would have used much clearer language. Okay, so that's a preview. So when you look at Chapter 3 and look at the uh, video, I think the next video, the next one or two videos, you'll see a discussion of these matters. And we'll talk more about that in the future. But next week, we have a special guest lecturer. Uh, and that happens to be Danny Levin, who's going to tell us about a wind tunnel model he's developed, talk a little bit about how flutter analysis and wind tunnel testing is really done. And then on Thursday, you're going to go down and see a live flutter test and no extra charge. And I think we're going to try to, to have our friends in Stockholm somehow view that, right? So we'll think. We'll see. we'll see. We're going to attempt that. Okay. Any questions before we break up? Stockholm, do you have any, have any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question regarding homework number three. Okay. Okay. Uh, when I'm solving the equations, uh, I get boundary condition and then equation of motion. So each boundary condition has uh, four limits. That means I have 16 boundary conditions. And I don't know how to interpret them. Okay. Someone get that and translate for me? <laughs> 16. <laughs> Well, that, I don't remember the number, but the number should be large. Yes. 16 but, sounds too large to me. You should have a boundary condition. You should have two boundary conditions at each of four boundaries. That's eight. Okay? Okay. And then there are some special conditions at the corners. And I think you only have two corners. So I think that would be 10. Okay. So, the plate but, equation, right? Well, the plate equation is a fourth order equation. So, at each op opposing boundaries, we respect two boundary conditions each, right? So, if I have four four boundaries, 
four times two is eight. How am I doing so far? And, but then at the corners, if you're very careful, right at the corner, you know, when, when two edges meet, you've got boundary conditions on each, each edge, but there turn out to be some special conditions right at the corner. Uh, but there are only two corners, right? Well, there are four corners, but, but two of them are associated with that, that edge where things are fixed, right? So I, th I, th I think I think the most you could get would be 12. I don't think you get 16. Uh, and you might get only 10 non trivial ones. Yes, yeah, so maybe they might be repeating. 16. They might be repeating. Uh, can you repeat this? Uh, I, I said that uh, there might be a repetition in the boundary condition when, when I substitute them to zero, so could be possible. No? So my question is, I'm not able to interpret these conditions. I mean, I don't, okay, maybe I got the number wrong, but how to interpret that result? You know, if you tell me the two boundary conditions on each edge, I will be through. If you, in addition to those, you tell me the the boundary conditions at the corners, I will be even more thrilled. And then if you come up with boundary conditions beyond that, we should sit down because we might want to write a paper. I don't think everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, right. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, Prof, I have one more question. Okay. Uh, this is again regarding the boundary conditions uh, um, uh, for the plate model. And when we compare uh, pure bending of any continuous surface as against uh, discontinuous surface, for example, a rectangular plate, apparently there are extra boundary conditions uh, at the corner points where it is discontinuous. Uh, I was not able to understand why you, uh, why you have the special boundary conditions. Well, ordinarily you don't apply those. Uh, as I discussed earlier this, today in, in the lecture, um, all those in the context of a much simpler problem, normally when you do plate theory, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to find functions that satisfy what I'll call the natural boundary conditions. The counterpart of saying that uh, d alpha dy is zero at the tip Right, because with a plate, if you think about it, it's going to be very hard to find functions like that. So normally, what you do with plate theory is you just find functions that that satisfy the geometric conditions, namely that you have zero displacement along a clamped edge and zero slope, and then you let the functions be what they will elsewhere, and then you do use Rayleigh Ritz, remember, rather than Mr. Galerkin. And uh, that assures you that through the Rayleigh Ritz formulation and the principle of virtual work, that your answer will be a good one. But uh, what I was asking in the homework is I just wanted to get, do an exercise where you use Hamilton's principle and work out all those beautiful equations, including the boundary conditions. Because most people will only do that once in their life, and I thought this would be your chance to do it. And once you've done it, you'll feel better, I'll feel better. And uh, hopefully you won't have to do it again. Does that help? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Durham, North Carolina. Well, any questions? You had a question? No. No, you're right. Any uh, any other questions? Okay, good. We'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>